So if you're watching it after the fact, um, I'm Brittany from Blockstack, and I'm here with Zavin from Lux Capital, as well as Manib um, Ali, who's the CEO of Blockstack PBC. So today we wanted to just address some of the questions that we've been getting from investors um, around Blockstack, and we thought a great way to do that is to have one of our existing investors, Zav from Lux Capital, to ask uh, some of the questions. Um, we will also be taking questions at the end from Telegram, so I will be fielding some of those as well. But um, to kick off, I would love to just start with a little background about Zav. So um, Lux Capital has been an early investor in Blockstack, and they've recently made headlines by having some of the largest M&A deals ever. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, the fund, Lux Capital, and then maybe we can go into your investment in Blockstack. Of course. Um, so I'm a partner at Lux Capital. Coincidentally, you guys know this, the, the outside world won't know this. We're located about 10, 10 uh feet downstairs uh, from you guys in the same building. We're bi-coastal as a firm, so San Francisco and New York. Uh, have north of or just about 1.5 billion under management across a number of active funds. Uh, we've been around for almost two decades and I've been at the firm for just about five years now. Uh, you know, I, th I think historically and, and, and really where we've centered, you know, the 110% the of our time and efforts have been around deep tech and emerging tech. Uh, increasingly so, I think that's in vogue. So you see a number of venture firms, I'm sure you guys are familiar with them, with maybe one or two people who spend maybe 20 or 30% of their time on deep tech or emerging tech. Uh, what makes us unique is that it's 100% of our people spending 100% <clears throat> of our time on deep tech. Uh, and, and, and really that, you know, candidly, that means anything from biotech, metamaterials, spaceships, satellites, uh, AI, crypto, self-driving cars, drones, a, a pretty broad gauntlet. Uh, it's a moving window over time, uh, but for sure, uh, you know, of course, crypto is something that we've spent a lot of time in and around. Uh, we, you know, I, I think have had a good run in the past, mm -hmm. you know, 12 months or so. But we sold Oris Surgical Robotics to Johnson & Johnson uh, for, you know, north of uh, $3 billion up front and, and then up to $6 billion, including payouts uh, in the privately funded, uh, at least healthcare space, that was the biggest M&A transaction of all time. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a nice kind of moment of validation for us. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think it'll, history will write it as small peanuts in comparison to what happens with you guys. So uh, no pressure there, of course. <laughs> and, and, and you guys sometimes even like uh, would fund cutting a research and even like find the team and put them of course, together so we, and like seed it. Like that's the model that, that got me really interested. We, in, we in do de novo company creation uh, a good bit. So we, we started a nuclear cleanup company, Curion, uh, in roughly around 2009, 2010. Uh, we sold that to a French PE firm for I think over 100x uh, of our kind of total capital in and it returned a multiple of our fund. Uh, a few years ago, we have Calliope, which is right here in New York. It's a mm -hmm. gut, gut brain access company that we started a number of an, an internal kind of AI and bio projects internally. And then, yep. um, you know, of course, I, I think we've carved out good names for ourselves as kind of, I think, thought leaders and leading investors in, in and around deep tech. And uh, I, I tell this to all of my entrepreneurs and, and, and founders and executives, but really our success is only... Uh, you know, a reflection of the substrate and the hard work that that you guys do. So, uh, thank you guys for anything else. Um, it, I, I'll, I'll share a little bit of our background in and around crypto, and then we can yeah. dive in. Yeah. Um, you know, before I entered venture in 2013, I actually was thinking about starting a cryptocurrency company. And one of the first things I did was I went in in and around the valley and uh, pitched a number of venture firms. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm Zavin. I've started a company in the past. I've been in and around tech. I did my undergrad and grad at Stanford in computer science. I think I have the right profile to start this cryptocurrency company. And unfortunately, I was not many, even Ryan, but the majority <laughs> of people laughed me out of the room. They said, look, we don't understand what you're talking about. Um, I was fortunate that one of the firms, Innovation Endeavors, kind of scratched their heads and said, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, and, and, and they said, you know, we don't really quite understand exactly what you're talking about in terms of, you know, crypto and, and software, but it looks like you understand all of these kind of emerging deep tech things. Why don't you join us instead? So I joined Innovation Endeavors in 2013. In 2014, I jumped out of Lux, which is where I've been. Uh, but that uh, experience of thinking about starting a crypto company actually catalyzed a course I taught at Stanford in 
late 2013 on cryptocurrencies. And one of the theses that came out of that course, again, this was early. So, you know, Bitcoin was really kind of the main thing. No one was talking about ledgers or decentralization or blockchains per se, but they were talking about the Bitcoin asset. Uh, I think Vitalik was in a house in Palo Alto thinking and starting Ethereum, but it was, mm-hmm. it was still really early. And the main thesis then for us uh, coming out of that course was, you know, it, crypto and, and Bitcoin are these interesting fiat alternatives. But if you kind of peel back the onion a little bit, the underlying technology really can be an interesting kind of uh, uh, primitive for a decentralized internet. Mm-hmm. If you can generalize it and if you can make it mature and stable and kind of, you know, make it robust in the same way that the centralized internet today is robust, uh, there's a there there for something that, you know, that's more than just not to trivialize alternative fiat currencies, but there's something more to that too. Uh, and so that was, that was our thesis. And unfortunately, at the time, the majority of companies we came across were building kind of alternative wallets or, you know, uh, altcoins or, you know, kind of what have you of that call it 2014 to 2016 vintage. Uh, and at that time, actually, one of my partners, Bilal Zuberi, based in Palo Alto, met Maneev coming out of YC. Uh, I unfortunately had just joined Lux, so we didn't actually get a chance to sync on it. But Bilal ended up writing a small angel check mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, in Blockstack. And maybe a year or two later, I think I finally met you and we were yep. chatting. And almost immediately, I went back to Bilal and said, Bilal, you know that thesis we've had now for a few years? That's exactly what they're doing. We should be investing not only individually as angels, but institutionally via Lux. And, and, and that's kind of what happened. Uh, so I think we were fortunate in terms of timing. There was a, there was a good amount of uh, serendipity. I think we had a prepared mind uh, to engage properly with you guys. We came in behind Union Square and the A, and then we, you know, we wrote a pretty significant check in the, in the initial token offering as well in 2017. Yes, and, and I think the interesting thing about that is uh, uh, Zavin actually has a blog post that kind of describes what we are trying to do, which predates the investment. <laughs> and Albert from Union Square Ventures yeah. also has a blog post that kind of describes what Blockstack is doing, which also predates the investment, right? So which, which kind of like says that these people were thinking the same things and they found a team that were trying to make it a reality and, and they, they basically uh, jumped in to support. That's awesome. I, yeah. I was not even aware of that, but I'll have to go back and check the archives. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to link to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is great. Well, thanks so much for the background on that. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, crypto moves so fast that, um, you know, I think it was today is Ethereum's like fifth birthday. So, mm-hmm. you know, thinking about the early days of that, and I think many of your research actually almost predates um, yes. Ethereum almost by a year or so. Uh, you know, I think it's this very long, long perspective here. Um, but obviously, I'm sure um, what you've seen lately, your maybe your perspective has changed. So I'm curious, you know, uh, what you're excited about now, especially having invested in a company like Blockstack. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I still think it's an incredibly exciting space. I feel exceptionally fortunate to have back you guys. I, you know, I, I still... I think hold closely and, and, and believe with a good amount of conviction in the central thesis of crypto as not only fiat alternatives, but as a substrate for decentralization. Uh, there's obviously still a lot of work to do to get there. Um, but by, uh, on a high level, what we think about internally at Lux is what are the key centralized components of the web and when, where, and how can we slowly disintermediate, you know, the, the monopolistic tendencies of those mm-hmm. uh, with decentralization? And can we do it in a way that is good for the community, that's usable for the community where everyone wins, but there's also, uh, you know, significant return for shareholders or early investors. And so that's, that's a high level thesis. We have invested uh, in the crypto space elsewhere. And I'll, I'll rattle off one quick one that we did recently. Uh, which, which was in a brilliant um, uh, computer science PhD uh, founder out of Portugal, Diogo, who started Anchorage. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we came in on that, and that was actually my partner, Brandon Reeves in Palo Alto, who, who did that investment for us. Uh, so we are, I think, actively hunting and still investing. And I, I will say because our thesis was never about short-term asset prices, uh, there was no skittishness on our end and, and you know, any of the kind of bear market of 2018 or there was no excessive bullishness on our end in any of the bull market of 2017. I think we've been pretty steadfast and, you know, really had a good cadence uh, and, and open mind with our investments in the space. Um, maybe I'll turn it over and uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to talk about Lux all I want, yeah, but I assume yeah. that everyone on the line here wants to okay, talk. One, one, one last fact about that. <laughs> so he was actually born in the city 
where I grew up in. And oh, really? Yeah, this is true. This is true. Yeah. We had no idea. I mean, we actually. Uh, I don't think we realized this until maybe we, a few months ago. We realized that. Um, pretty late. And uh, <laughs> I was born in the city that you grew up in, and yes. the hospital that I was born in was actually named after my older sister. So it was a totally like weird thing, yeah. Small crypto. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll turn it around, and you know, I think from our end, we we internally at Lux, we we talk about BlockSec uh, Monday during our partnership meetings, and one of the questions we get or that I get internally from the rest of my partners is, "Oh man, we've been invested in BlockSec for a number of years, and for a long time, it was a bunch of just brilliant computer scientists working and engineering heads down." Uh, really avoiding a lot of the noise and the froth of the uh, of the kind of 2016 to 2018 news cycle, uh, but really building significant technology. And maybe over, over the last one or two quarters, it feels like we are increasingly so in the news. Uh, there are more and more announcements coming from us. Uh, so you know, taking a step back, just at a, at a high level, how are we thinking about the state of the union of, yep. of, of Blockstack? <laughs> What's driving the news? Uh, and, and you know what, what's driving a lot of our recent progress? Yeah, I think I think basically you, you, you got it right that uh, the early I would say four years mm -hmm. were hardcore R and D, mm -hmm. where it was a bunch of computer scientists. We have a bias towards Princeton only because you know the, the company started <laughs> there, and we ended up hiring kind of like the best minds that we could find, and they ended up being Princeton computer scientists. But we were heads down effectively doing R and D work in our office. We weren't like going around telling the world about it mm -hmm. because if you're building, we need to get the foundation right. The foundation needs to be scalable. It needs to be secure. Uh, before we tell developers to spend enough time building on top of us. Yeah. Right. So we got that part right. We published that uh, research and peer reviewed conferences, and then we switched to infrastructure building. mode. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that is timed with actually the Lux and Lux, the series A that Union Square Ventures mm -hmm. led. Yep was the transition from R&D mode to infrastructure building. So that's 2017 and 2018. And in Q4 of last year, uh, we launched the Stacks blockchain, which was the kind of like the, uh, a fairly significant missing piece of our architecture. And people now, uh, developers can now build applications very easily now, right? So we are switching from infrastructure building to developer traction. And that's what you're noticing where applications built on top went from 17 to 46 to 86 to yep. 170, right? So yep. there's almost like a growth engine. Yep. And we, we worked on uh, kind of like the game theory behind it with some professors from Princeton and NYU. And there are developer incentives that are baked into our protocol, uh, where imagine that a developer could be an early miner on our network. Sure. Uh, the, the ones we're building right now, they are not. Because, because of regulations, we're not distributing any tokens to them. These guys are building for the love of the technology and to participate in the pilot program, but that's going to kick in now. And were these all developers who had heard about Blockstack in the past, but it was while you guys were, while we were in R&D mode? Or are the developers who are hearing it from word of mouth, who are hearing it about, maybe about it because they've been researching the space, maybe they happen to hold Stacks tokens, where are these developers coming they don't, from? They don't hold Stacks tokens. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not accredited investors, yep. so they couldn't actually participate in the 2017 offering. I think some of them come for our community because they care about privacy, they care about having an open, decentralized internet. Yep. But most of the new developers are actually coming outside of crypto mm -hmm. because, because as, a, as almost like a strategy, sure. uh, we are not targeting people who are building in crypto currently. Like I think the, uh, and, and I, I don't want mean to offend anyone, there are some brilliant <laughs> engineers in the crypto industry, but but relatively speaking, the level of sophisticated engineering in crypto versus outside, there are much more brilliant people who are kind of like outside of crypto and we want yeah. to attract them, yeah. right? We want to, that's the blue ocean of developers. Sure. And most of our uh, kind of like growth initiatives are targeted towards them. And when you think about, or when we think about growth internally, do we focus on what are the kind of key KPIs that, that are good metrics for us on growth? Are they number of developers, number of applications, number of end users on the applications, all so, of the above? Yeah, currently we are looking at the number of independent teams mm -hmm. that are actively building on the platform. And we define active through our uh, app mining program yeah. because they have to actively participate in it. 
uh, and every month there's a ranking of the top applications, which means that here is a set of completely independent teams. It, it's almost like experiments or real mm -hmm. apps, and we want to see thousands of them on, on top of the platform. And we are slowly, I think that's the thing that is getting more stable. Yep. And we are now slowly shifting our focus towards user growth mm -hmm. and more importantly, user engagement. That okay. how many users are kind of like coming back to these applications and there are privacy concerns around how do you, you even measure that? Right? Yeah. Like you can't have trackers in these mm -hmm. applications and things like that. But we are, in, if, you, if you're look, projecting, let's say six months down the road or, or a year, we will uh, kind of like maintain our focus on developers, sure. but start paying more and more attention to what's happening with, uh, with the user growth. Mm -hmm. And how do we, there, the, I always think of the, the platform as having three main kind of prongs. One is the developers, mm -hmm. the other is obviously the end users of the applications, and the last are the investors, right? And in some sense, I, th I think you alluded to this earlier, some of the developers are almost, by definition, the investors through app mining, right? How do we balance the focus internally? Uh, how do we how do we make sure that the incentives and the game theory between the outside investors and the developer miners are properly balanced? What what's our thinking on yeah. that? Well, I mean, you probably heard the news that we have done a, a regulated offering with the SEC. I have heard that. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, um, no, please check this out. This is always, by the way, for everyone else, this is one because I know all these answers, but I get to ask as if I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that offering, um, the whole goal was to be able to open it up so that um, retail investors are able to participate and in purchase stocks tokens. Um, one, we think that's important because these are the people who are helping build the network. Mm -hmm. So it's not just sophisticated investors who got in early, like a Lux Capital, uh, but these are the people who are actually using the applications and building on top. Mm -hmm. And so by democratizing that access to investors in the US, it actually means that anyone who holds like Stacks tokens is in the same boat. So it's less of a distinction of um, investors who are you know, trying to fund early R&D that there's no product yet. This is actually kind of making everyone on the same plane where they can help um, contribute to the network, they can help build the network, they can benefit from um, you know, securing the network. There's all these different ways that we can have those incentives together yeah. without it feeling like very separate pools of people. And I think one of the most unique things, if not the most unique thing we've done, um, has been really holding hands and being ultra transparent and crisp and clear with SEC and various kind of regulatory bodies around what we're doing. And, and really, I think not only setting a path for success for ourselves, but then enabling those around us, other crypto decentralization <laughs> projects to look at what we've done and then you know, follow a similar playbook. What was the genesis of that idea for us? Because it, it really was, when, I think when we decided to do it, it was a contrarian take. It would cost a lot of capital. It would slow down our development. We would have to be heads down. There are a lot of reasons not to do it. And I think looking back, we absolutely did the right thing. Mm -hmm. But maybe walk me through that thinking at, at the time when we decided to do it initially. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's basically, if you go back to that time, this is the 2017 offering where our core community and developers couldn't participate mm -hmm. in the round that Lux Capital could. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we gave them these vouchers. They were non-binding vouchers that let us work on a legal framework mm -hmm. uh, through which we can actually distribute these tokens to you. And we will give you the same price. And part of me feels actually really good that we are fulfilling that promise. Yep. Those early members are getting the 12 cents price that Lux got in the 2017 offering. And the reason to do it was the options were really either you ban U.S. investors and you move offshore. Like we are, we are based here. We actually think the U.S. public markets are very important to open up, not just for uh, investment perspective, but Silicon Valley is here. You yep. want all these companies to be building on top of your technology. And you can't say that this asset is banned in the U.S. and you, you can't participate. Yeah. Right. And other options are, hey, just do it and then um, prepare for litigation with regulators. Right, like yeah. I, I, I am an entrepreneur. I like to take risks. Yep. These are not the kind <laughs> of risks I am I'm willing to take. Uh, but I think the final uh, thing that really convinced me was like when we started our initial dialogue with the yep. SEC. And I'm, I'm I'm a computer scientist, and I was like learning about securities regulations, trying to be the bridge between the two things. And I uh, I think the aha moment was when we realized that the technology can adapt faster to regulations than regulations can adapt to the technology. A lot of people were asking for the laws to change. Mm -hmm. And we said, you could actually 
tweak the technology. That's beautiful. So yeah. that you you can still get the decentralization properties. I, I actually think that the um, impact of this SEC qualification, uh, A, we can't really talk about it right now. We are, we are busy <laughs> doing other things, mm -hmm. but there are so, it's such a sophisticated legal analysis and it yeah. has so many implications. Like for example, things that, that we had to deal with was our miners broker dealers? And the answer is no. Yep. You know how big of a win that is for the industry with, with, with the framework like that? And similarly, uh, the tokens on our network are completely fungible, yep. right? So it's actually a win for open technology. It's a win for decentralization yep. that we have the SEC qualification. So you're getting all of the benefits like everything is transparent. Like yep. There is a mini IPO like filing where everything is disclosed. Uh, and and uh, there's less information asymmetry between sure. people like us, sure. the, the insiders, and the general public, right? yep. because they can just go and read everything. But it's actually a huge win for decentralization. Uh, imagine uh, the kind of reaction regulators are having to Facebook Libra, yep. right? which is a permission system. We got a permissionless system that is decentralized. This token is fungible, can be used on the network, and the regulators are fine with it. They're saying that yes, this framework works. That's amazing. What I'm curious from a regulatory perspective, I don't, I'm not even candidly sure if this has an effect, but given our national and international presence, how we think about regulations in the US as opposed to regulations abroad, and then also, you know, taking a step back, how we think about growth both from a developer perspective, but then also from an investor perspective nationally versus abroad. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to talk about the regulatory. I'm happy to talk about the good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. So I think from a, from a regulations perspective, uh, it's, it's, so the Stacks token is a utility token, Yep. right? It has real utility. There are 170 applications. People can register their usernames or other digital assets. And interestingly, uh, if, if people look at our filing, there is a discussion about non-security regions. Hmm. It's a very interesting discussion because those are uh, jurisdictions outside of the US okay. where we did a legal analysis. And it was very clear that the token is a utility token and not a security. So broadly speaking, internationally, uh, we think that in most jurisdictions, again, you have to check with local law and, 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 and basically see what the uh, specifics are. But broadly speaking, internationally, it would be treated as a utility token. Okay. Right. Uh, I have to give a disclaimer. Yeah, I know. Right? I was like, sure. we'll put the disclaimer up. <laughs> that, the that screen is flashing. It, 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 the yeah. disclaimer is flashing. Yeah. That it, it depends on the jurisdiction yeah. we're talking about, and the local law needs to be fine with the treatment, and we have only done the analysis in six jurisdictions, which we feel are, sure. are very important, and we have disclosed that in the filing as the non-security regions. But in the U.S., the, the, the way the SEC approaches this is uh, according to their tests, um, we are basically saying that it's a utility token, but we are going to comply with securities regulations mm -hmm. in the short term. Okay. Right? And then there's a whole discussion around how uh, there's a path to decentralization and uh, when certain uh, kind of like uh, updates happen and BlockSack PBC is even less in control of the development of the network or there are independent miners there, or there are engineers who are, um, who are affiliated with other organizations sure. and they're building the core protocol, uh, if our filings with the SEC would no longer be relevant. Yep. Right. So it's, it's almost like uh, having a framework for how to start something when a company is kind of like, we are, we are kind of like leading the development of these open source technology, but then how do you transition it off so that the network is decentralized enough that even in the US, uh, it's no longer treated as, as a security. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I'll do the quick disclaimer <laughs> is available. Uh, we do have an active sale going on yep. at StacksToken.com. So our lawyers will be happy to know that we're letting people know that uh, StacksToken.com slash hashtag disclaimer has the full disclaimer of what Muneev just said. Um, and a lot of that information is also in our offering circular, which yes. is that 150 page plus um, investment memo, basically, um, or public offering memo yes. um, about it's a, block sack. <laughs> so. it's, it's, it's 184 pages. Wow. <laughs> and this does not include all of the supplementary material. Yeah. This is the main offering circular. 
And that offering circular is the source of truth. Awesome. Right? So every, everyone should go read the offering circular. And most of the times, we actually use the language from the circular in our like FAQs and other communications. Sure, it'll be a nice weekend read for most people. Yeah, yeah uh. we really encourage people to read it. Um, yeah, and that's at stackstoken.com slash uh, circular. Slash the circular. Yes, right? yes, you and can so check that. Brittany and I, we were in Asia uh, uh, recently, and we, I think it was in Korea, where there was a lawyer who was doing a fireside chat. Yeah. He was like super interested in our, in our approach. And when the fireside chat started, he showed up with a printout or a, of our offering circular, just placed it on a table, <laughs> and, and was like, "Let's talk about this." Yeah, yeah. So we we did spend some time in Asia earlier this year, and we've just seen such a growth in interest mm -hmm. um, in the developer community as yeah. well in Asia. So I think um, we've had team members go to uh, you know Japan, um, or well, we're, we're heading to Japan. Uh, people are just in China. Yep. We were in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea earlier this year. Yes. So mm -hmm. we've just seen a lot of interest there. We've, huh. um, we realize there's such a huge uh, talent pool of developers who are ready for tools like this. Um, the message of what Blockstack's about really resonates. This idea of you know, data ownership and what that means in these different jurisdictions is, yep. is very clear. Um, especially from some of our recent meetups, people really found that that resonated. And so we continue to think about Blockstack as a global project. So how do we you know, build that ecosystem, not just here in the US with things like regulation, but also expanding into these new countries that operate very differently, um, even compared to each other, even though they're geographically closer. Uh, so that's been a big focus um, for us as well. So we see, you know, really continuing to expand on that, yeah. um, especially as the Stacks token is more, you know, fungible across borders. As and well. is that is the fungibility of the Stacks token one of the main drivers in the international growth of kind of developer evangelism and adoption, or is there something else happening behind the scenes? I think I think it's like um, like. It, Broadly speaking, I think this is my view yeah. that um, in the crypto industry, things are generally overhyped, yeah. right? And then they don't live up to the promises. Right? Like people are like, "This is going to be world changing," or "This will be ready by X time." To the moon, right? yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> you can say these things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, like, we are a team that is like disciplined. Uh, we we would we would much rather like under promise, yeah. and we would we like for for the longest time we didn't even feel comfortable that developers should really be you know building on top of us as their full-time job. Now there are people who are quitting their full-time jobs and this is what they're doing because we feel comfortable in the underlying technology that it works, it scales. Uh, and, and I think what we are noticing now is that this idea of an open decentralized internet or this idea of a natural evolution of cloud computing to decentralized computing yep. is something that resonates with a lot of people. There are many actually projects who have similar messaging, similar uh, kind of like mission. And when people discover Blockstack, the aha moment for them is, oh, wait, this actually works. Yep. They have actually solved all the hard challenges. I can, act, I can spend like a couple of hours and, and have a real application built on top and, and, and try to make it work. Or, it, oh, it's super easy. If you're a user, your experience is, hey, I'm using a decentralized app and this feels like using a normal, a normal app, right? Mm -hmm. Or yeah. the performance is the same as like you've used Graphite, the, yep. the Google Docs yeah. alternative. The performance is kind of similar to uh, using Google. In a lot Docs. of ways, it's better, right? Yes. Yeah. And 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 uh, I think that's that's part of like what's attracting a lot of people here. Going back to Asia, I think like uh, I I would I wish that I would have realized the importance of Asia earlier. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my first time really in Hong Kong was in January this year, hmm. where uh, uh, we, we had an event there. And then we kind of like realized how important the region is. It's pretty big in crypto in general. Yeah. But I think it's really important for cutting edge technology as well. People tend to jump on whatever is the, uh, is the next kind of like wave of uh, cutting edge technology. And, the, uh, the, and they, for example, in Korea, I think more than half of the population already has crypto wallets. Yep. Right, which is very different penetration from, let's say, the US. So within the last six months, I think we have ramped up our focus on Asia to the extent that in this offering, we had a separate allocation 
mm-hmm. for Asian investors. Um, and uh, I, I definitely ran this line by, by legal <laughs> before we started the, the fireside chat. Uh, so we will be making an announcement tomorrow morning where we are announcing the funds were actually leading uh, the investment okay. on the Asia allocation. And I'm super excited about who they are. Uh, they were pretty much like number one on our list. And they're the people uh, who were super early in crypto uh, in Asia. Okay. They actually helped projects like Ethereum with early adoption, with early community building. And the fact that you know, they're coming in and, and leading the, the Asia allocation for us uh, it is something that we are we're super excited about. But we will we'll release the details uh, tomorrow. tomorrow morning. Yeah. Well, one of the few things we've touched on briefly a few times now, but I want to make sure that we have a chance to actually dial in and, and discuss it, is May this year, we launched, I think, version 2.0 of our white paper. Mm-hmm. And the last one had been, we'd, we'd launched in 2017. So two years. Um, was it just, you know, crossing the I, dotting the I's and crossing the T's or, you know, was, was there actual semantic updates in terms of the R&D and the research yeah. and the underlying platform work that we put together? Absolutely. So this was, this was something new for me as well, right? Like, um, so my, my background is <clears throat> distributed systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're in a research lab, you're working on a hard problem, you build out a prototype, you publish the paper, and the publication marks the end of your research. Yep. Right. And then people are citing the paper and it, it lives on as, as like the paper is the artifact. Whereas when I shift over to kind of like trying to commercialize uh, cutting edge research and through Blockstack, interestingly, the technology is moving so fast that your documents are becoming outdated. So our 2016 uh, publication at Usenix, which is one of the uh, top conferences in distributed systems, that paper is like, fully outdated. I, I, I almost recommend people to not read it, hmm. right? And then we released something in 2017, and within two years, the architecture has evolved, and the paper is no longer accurate. Yep. So we almost like had to do the work of uh, actually updating it, and now I'm, I'm kind of like ready for it. Like, hey, just like mentally prepare yourself yeah. that uh, the paper is almost like a living doc, and we, in a couple of years, we might have to do another iteration. One, one interesting thing about um, our white paper is that if people uh, try to read it, I think it's on blockstack.org slash whitepaper.pdf. The second page actually lists all of the work that went into the white paper. Mm-hmm. It includes three publications and two doctoral dissertations. Wow. So that's like my PhD thesis and Jude Nelson, who's a core developer, yep. plus the publications that, uh, that we did working with Vincent professors. Right? So this is, this is not like, like, hey, someone just wrote up a white paper with pie in the sky ideas. This is serious work that happened over multiple years, which resulted in the white paper 2.0. Yeah. One of the things in, in, in the same period of time that I've seen us do that's really matured in Lux's eyes, the kind of maturity or robustness and, and, and I think accelerated block stack has been our access to talent. We brought in people like Brittany, I think Dee Walker just joined, yep. Dave Morin from, from Path as an advisor, which I think for us was a huge coup. Uh, talk me through how we're getting access to those people. Mm-hmm. I think, it, again, it's an anomaly in the space where you tend to get a lot of you know, I would say gray hat hackers, maybe, maybe working on these projects, yep. but few, few actual executives, let alone kind of tech luminaries, a la, you know, Dave, um, what's our strategy been and how have we been so successful in executing it? Yep. I think first I'll let Brittany describe her journey <laughs> because she, she, the way I like to think about it is like she was investing her money yep. mm-hmm. and then she started investing with her most scarce resource, like her time. <laughs> But, uh, but I'll, I'll let her explain the, the, the background. Yeah, well, so, you know, I was at Union Square Ventures yep. when I first learned about Blockstack, and that was around the time they came out of Y Combinator. So that was uh, 2014. And so we, as a firm, we were kind of looking for non-financial applications of the blockchain. And so when we saw uh, Blockstack, we saw Maneeb and Ryan pitch, it was like dead on for things that we were looking for. Yeah. You know, at the time, the question was about, Hey, these are PhD researchers. Of course, they're smart, but like, how are they going to, you know, build this over time? So we made just a seed investment. It was pretty early on, Um, and then as the project grew, I continued to have opportunities to invest. 
So I, I invested in the token sale as well. After I left Union Square Ventures, I ran my own fund um, where we had like a 20% focus on crypto. So getting to participate again was really great. And then uh, joining the team earlier this year uh, was a big part of actually helping the project come to life. Yep. Um, because I think I talked to Maneeb last year and the team was still mostly PhDs, mostly doing work on the core blockchain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, I'm happy to help, but my expertise is not on building distributed systems, you know, yep. <laughs> it's yeah. about bringing these projects to market. So I was really happy to come on this year as we think about going into that, like, maturity phase, growth phase, like how do we get the community buy-in um, to this to really make it a successful project that outlives uh, Blockstack BBC and outlives yep. like all of the original, um, you know, work that was on it. Like many have said, just how quickly this industry evolves. So that's what really drove me um, to join the project. But I so think- the, the, <laughs> the trick that I pulled was, I was like, Brittany, how much time can you spend with us? And she's like, I don't know, I'm really busy, maybe like four hours. I'm like, we'll take any amount of time <laughs> yeah. because where I feel confident is that once people actually start seeing what's mm -hmm. happening here internally, uh, they, they, they see like how motivated people are. Sometimes I joke that, you know, these people would work on this for free. Yeah, like the 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 salary and any, mm -hmm. uh, any financial upside with like, uh, equity grants or token yeah. grants these are just there yeah uh, and it's i think it's true sure, like the new so, york so, department of labor is happy to hear that we meet all uh, regulations we yeah. pay yeah. people properly but it was like i think the from my uh where i was sitting like it was like when she experienced it a little bit she was like, okay, maybe I want to get more involved. And I kept on throwing like more and more responsibility. <laughs> yeah. And we were so excited when she uh, actually started working full time. But I think in general, uh, it's a little bit of a trend where people, and I, I firmly believe this, I think most of the really talented people currently do not work in crypto. Like they're outside of crypto. Yep. They might be skeptical of crypto. Uh, they might be curious. They might be, yeah, it's interesting. I've seen it, but you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical. So you have, generally what I've done, and same thing with two of our uh, core developers, both are PhDs from uh, Princeton, they were super uh, skeptical. Uh, one was actually joining Google's core uh, security group and convincing him out of like, don't go to Google, uh, come to this like small startup and where we are trying to build these things. It was like helping them get over yep. like whatever is the reason that they think that this technology will not work or it's a, it's a crazy idea. But also at the same time, slowly, uh, crypto is like a rabbit hole, right? Like it's such a complex set of problems and it's almost like brilliant minds, they, they want to work on complex problems. So you almost like introduce the problem, go away, come back in a week or two and then talk to them again and like slowly like keep pulling them in. Uh, but but the but I think by far, and it's not about just engineers. So we were able to hire uh, Sora. He uh, before this he worked at BlackRock hmm. for ten years, and he was the controller for BlackRock Americas hmm. and the CFO for BlackRock Canada. Wow! Like imagine taking him. He was I think he was a controller for I forget the exact number, probably like four trillion dollars in assets. But getting someone like him to come join a less than 25 person company yeah. because we needed that kind of rigor. We were doing the SEC filing. Uh, for him, it was, it was kind of like a similar approach. But, but the funny thing with that hire was uh, he said that I'm a fan of the Silicon Valley show and your startup reminds me of it. <laughs> and I said, why don't you go back and check the credits? Uh, I'm an advisor to the show and the season five is based on Blockstack. That, that just sealed the, the, the deal for it. That's awesome. It's also, yeah, great work with smart people and, yeah. uh, you know, um, getting to work with everyone else that was here. So the team continues to grow. So Saurabh gets to that. tell his kids that he's working on the real life <laughs> yeah. version of the HBO show. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've touched on this too, but haven't had a chance to, to really flesh it out. Uh, I think one of the things that we've done a good job is hiring outside consultants and being extra transparent and, and honest and rigorous with how we're thinking about token economics, both on the app mining side, but then also on the external investor side. Maybe walk us through not only the initial thinking from the 2017 offering, but then also 
the changes in our thinking and, and, and how we're, you know, the, the global view of it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so in 2017, um, as Manib mentioned, the, the white paper made a lot of sense at the time. You know, mm-hmm. it was still early days for a lot of things in crypto, especially around tokens. And, um, you know, coming into 2019 and looking back, it seemed so simple and so basic. Like mm-hmm. things around token economics, such as like fixed inflation, Um, I think at the time, Ethereum was kind of using this model like, oh, well, of course, inflation will just be fixed over time forever. Um, And when you take a second look at that, that doesn't really make much sense for how a network will operate and work. So, you know, we had some ideas internally about how to think about structuring our token economics, both based on research that's now been published, Mm -hmm. um, other projects, like things that are out in market, we've been able to actually see grow but we also wanted expertise brought in as well. So we did um, work with Prism Group, Mm -hmm. which is a token economic um, consultancy. So basically they have uh, a number of economists. Um, I think they actually have a Nobel laureate economist um, who advises their team, taking a look at all of the different uh, pieces that impact uh, token economics. So we had them run an independent report and we were able to then use their recommendations to make sure that our token economics were kind of more battle tested from an external view of like, how will this work with game theory, consumer behavior, um, you know, general economics, uh, price changes, fluctuations, speculation, all of these different things kind of baked in together. And I think that's so important because our team is very lean and we know a lot about um, certain things and we have experts on our team, but anywhere we don't have the expertise or we really want to have validation from external opinions. Like, I think it makes a lot of sense to leverage people who are the best in the field with what they do. Yep. Yeah, I, w- I really want to stress that point, right? Like, I've, I've actually seen a bunch of other projects in crypto who, because of their early success, uh, kind of like have these, the mindset that I know best yep. and I'm going to be the person who designs the distributed system, but also the token economics, but also the game theory, but also something else, right? And we have a very explicit thing that realize where your skill set is. Like I, I have a deep background in distributed systems. I am not a game theorist. So yep. our app mining paper, uh, where pe- people can find that on blocksag.org slash papers, uh, you will notice that I'm even not even a co-author of it, right? Mm-hmm. It is, professors from Princeton and NYU who independently wrote a paper designing the game theory around hmm. app mining. Similarly, when it came to token economics, yep. we did an audit from experts assuming that, hey, guys, we, we made a, the initial model, but you're the experts here. Let's just try to do a much deeper analysis. And I think that, that broader thinking of realizing where your limitations are, where do you shine and where do you need help, and then actively going out and getting those people involved with the project is something that is, that is very important. Mm-hmm. To the extent that you can disclose this, um, you know, imagine we're sitting in here having a similar fireside Q&A 12 months from now, 24 <laughs> months from now, somewhere, somewhere there. Uh, what are we talking about? What have we accomplished? What are the upcoming milestones? What are the two of you guys both excited about? Yeah, so that that's a question. I, I know you have you have kind of like already said that. What can you disclose? Uh, where there are a lot of like restrictions around it. Uh, like I think if people look at disclaimers, they will see that there are disclaimers around forward-looking statements. Mm-hmm. There are also uh, if there's anything material that we have in the works, it should be disclosed in our SEC circular, mm-hmm. right? Or if mm-hmm. there is something material that happens since the filing of the circular, we should be disclosing it with the SEC first yep. so that everyone gets uh, access to the same information, right? So with that context in mind, meaning that we can comment very little and most of the things are already kind of like disclosed. As I men- mentioned in general, I think uh, it is safe to assume a little bit of a shift from de- focusing like only on developer growth to starting to look at user growth as well, mm. right? So that's that, I think that's one thing. The other, other thing is that um, uh, the call that we made about, about legal frameworks that actually has um, implications around exchanges. And we get that question a lot. In our um, SEC circular, we basically say that there are no authorized US exchanges uh, currently. Right? That can change 
a year from now. Obviously, again, forward-looking statements. I, I, I have no uh, yeah. kind of like, you know, uh, magic uh, <laughs> yeah. to wand. Like no, yeah. Yeah. Things, yeah. Right? Yeah. But just logically speaking, like we were able to get through yep. the SEC. It's entirely possible that other people are able to get through as well. And that means that now there are more regulated, transparent ways for uh, kind of like doing trades or their uh, markets around these things. And I, I, I think I am uh, not going to comment like too much on that side, but this is, um, this is a crypto asset and uh, it is being kind of like uh, distributed to a wider audience now. If we look at like a year from now or later, you would assume that more people are able to get their uh, hands on the asset. They're able to use it on the network. Uh, and if you look at our kind of like growth numbers on the applications, uh, I think it is also something where you can safe to assume that we should be getting more applications on the, on, on the platform, uh, especially uh, looking at the fact that we are going to 10x the rewards that are going to developers. So there are incentives, and this is disclosed in the filing, yep. Mm -hmm. that we would be giving out up to a million dollars a month mm. to developers, yep. which is at that level, it becomes like a serious incentive for developers to come and um, basically build on the park. Yeah, and more sort of short term, I guess. Yeah. So that's very forward looking. And um, I think even just the next three months, um, some of the things that we'll see is that since this is the first SEC regulated um, offering, we have that offering open now. It's by default open for 60 days. So we will go through the entire like sales process. Mm -hmm. um, we have the vouchers who many have mentioned as well. So these kind of make our project pretty unique. And I think after the uh, close of the sale, we will then have like 30 days to do a hard fork and actually release those um, tokens out to everyone who put in a purchase request. So even just that step is a new milestone for Blockstack and also from the regulatory front, like this has never been done yep. before. Right. So I think we'll have a lot of retrospectives that we can kind of talk about a year from now too, even before we hit some of these other large milestones that when he was talking about yeah, as well. Th that actually reminds me of something you asked earlier, that what were we doing in our token offerings that was different or almost like scaring away people who are not interested in the project, sure. but they just want to flip the token on day one. So one thing that we have is everyone has monthly unlocks, like including the team, including the people who participated yep. in 2017. And secondly, if you remember, uh, we had a cap of a maximum of 3 million for investors. Sure. Because instead of having a single investor who puts in like 10, $20 million, and has liquid tokens that they can just flip on day one, we wanted to discourage that behavior, right? Yep. So we wanted to have as many investors as possible, even if the checks are uh, smaller. And we are doing the same thing with the public offering. Right? So uh, this is disclosed again, that anyone who wants to put in more than 200,000, now the, the number has moved, yep. uh, gets flagged in our flow, and they need to manually talk to our team, yep. which means Brittany. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we actually have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> crypto pumping down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the people who are writing smaller checks, even yep. like $100 checks, yep. uh, they are the ones that, that we are interested in. And the larger parties would effectively, uh, they get flagged. And I'll say even, um, I think I'm allowed to disclose this, even Lux, we institutionally invested in the 2017 offering and we capped out whatever you would let us have. I think rightfully so on your, your part because of exactly this, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Your uh, Lux is actually disclosed in our SSD offering. Yeah. yeah. We were hoping. Well, we have a very active Telegram conversation okay. happening, so I've just been checking in. Um, so I don't know if, uh, you know if we have more questions or more time. No, 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 no. End, let, we'll let the in. outside world come in. <laughs> yeah. So we'll make sure and get some of these answered. Um, there's a few that are kind of around um, applications. So you guys have you know discussed mm -hmm. the 170 plus applications. Mm -hmm. um, so people want to know kind of about the quality of the applications since many of them are fairly new, mm -hmm. and also potentially about the inflection point of when you know user engagement and applications are kind of growing in in lockstep. Yeah. Uh, so like, so how will that shift happen? <laughs> I, I would say that if you look at app mining rankings. Uh, one, one thing that I'm personally very excited about is new people like who have just started building on Boxstack are able to climb up the rankings very quickly. 
I think I think someone was sharing just today that there are maybe four applications who just started and they're already in the top 10, which means that the app mining incentives are attracting higher quality teams, mm -hmm. which results in better quality applications, mm -hmm. right? And in, I think in general, broadly, so there, there, are, there is some work that we do which impacts all the applications. Uh, one is kind of like the reliability and performance of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, like if our storage is really fast, it makes all the applications fast, right? So that, that is something we have done. But some of the work we are doing right now is on onboarding and making it super simple for people to sign up and, and use the applications. When we improve that, I think the, the quality of all the applications uh, kind of like goes up. And in, ge in general, I, I agree that some of the apps might look clunky uh, compared to like what the polished applications yeah. that people might be used to on Web 2.0. But the functionality is there, right? And and as they have incentives to improve their quality, and they're, they're, this, that's the game theory, right? Like they have to improve their experience yep. to kind of like retain their spot in, uh, in in app mining, especially when more sophisticated players start entering because the uh, uh, the the incentives are going up by 10x. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and I'm, I'm sure you guys are not allowed to say this, but I'm excited about this, is that as we can expect over the next 12 or 24 months, the liquidity of these DAX tokens to increase as various exchanges hit their regulatory thresholds that allow stacks tokens to be traded on them. Um, I think that'll increase developer evangelism and excitement and adoption. I think that'll increase the maturity of developers that we're bringing onto the platform, which will, you know, touch wood, I think, translate into more robust and kind of beautiful UI UX type projects on it. Uh, but it's not unlike, you know, circa 2007, 2008, when the first iPhone apps that really had, uh, you know, I would say like non-linear growth were, you know, cheesy shotgun apps or, you know, really, really kind of kitschy, weird stuff. <laughs> Remember that when you could drink a beer? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> and, and, and we can look back at them now and kind of laugh and say, man, those were goofy. But the maturity and the sophistication of the developers building on iOS only increased as the app store kind of gained yes. kind of visibility mm -hmm. and a profile. And we have a beautiful kind of economic model to really kind of bootstrap that. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a matter of timing, timing, not if, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're starting to see it, I think even just on a monthly basis today. Yeah. 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 yeah maybe these, these two questions are kind of related. They're about um, one, like if the public is unaware that the internet is broken, how do you expect them to change new ways of doing things? Or will it be more transparent? Because obviously, like one of the big selling points around data, pri data privacy and kind of related to that is, you know, what are the private data lockers? How do they work and what makes them distinct? So I think these are kind of key features in a lot of these apps. And one's about like, how do you inform the public? And then two, like, what's actually happening in the back end of that? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, take, I'll reverse that, right? I'll, I'll answer the private data lockers first. And I think... Uh, both for the private data lockers and for the universal login that people get. Uh, one way to, to look at it as these things should have been a part of the internet. Like, like imagine that you know, mm -hmm. back in the 90s, somehow we had the technology where everyone gets a universal login and you can mm -hmm. log into anything you want on the internet with it and you don't have to create new accounts. I, I think people would agree that that would have been great. Like, uh, why would I create like a thousand different accounts and passwords that get leaked and all of that? So we are, in a way, uh, we are giving everyone that missing piece of, of uh, having a universal login. The second thing is, like, imagine a private home drive for you on the internet where every application is writing data with you. So you're not concerned about, hey, my data is with all these thousand different applications, or what if it gets leaked, or I want to delete my account, I want to download my data. All those problems just go away, and there's, a, there's this home drive where all of the data is. Your private data locker through, through Gaia is effectively that. Mm -hmm. And we have designed it in a way that it is very performant. Uh, you can replicate it, and then we take care of most of the kind of like logistics behind it. And applications are writing data with you. And now users are in control. So, uh, so like, I think for normal users, they should picture that instead of all of their data being with Facebook, the data is with them by default, mm -hmm. right? And, and they can stop using Facebook, start using something else, and the data goes with them. Uh, and that kind of like takes us to the first question that how would people even realize that the internet is broken? I think it's more like having realistic alternatives 
Like imagine how much anger is out there against Facebook. Like the Congress is angry at them. <laughs> yeah. Normal people are angry at them. Elections are coming up again, right? And, and there was such huge scandals around uh, control of these large tech companies uh, around uh, uh, like manipulation of uh, user emotions or using their data in ways that is not okay with the users. But people just don't have alternatives. Like you can be angry, but you have nowhere to go, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And what we are doing is we are saying, these apps need to perform at or better than the existing ones. And they need to be as simple or simpler to use than existing ones so yep. that people have a real outlet. Like the next time you get angry, you can actually just delete Facebook and go somewhere else, right? Or delete whatever uh, uh, service you are using and, and go to a real alternative. My, my, my sense is that on the end user side, we'll see users want to use them, they'll have a real, they will be a better UI, UX, better experience for them. Um, I think in large part, the centralized internet has so many kind of intermediaries that cut a lot of economic fat away from the user. Uh, So I see a world where once you remove those intermediaries, it economically makes sense for users to work on decentralized apps. Uh, Similarly, or the converse, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but it's something that we think a lot about internally at Lux, is in a lot of ways from the developer perspective, you're mo- removing a lot of the uh, the burden of DevOps, yes. right? Uh, and uh, over time, we can expect, and I think we're already seeing it with our early developers, they're able to build applications, they're able to iterate much faster. You mentioned it even on a monthly basis, you're seeing new kind of incoming applications enter the top 10, the top five, the top three, and that's because the pace of deployment and the pace of iteration on block stack is so much faster than working on an AWS or a Google Cloud or an Azure with all of the kind of various hodgepodge of, uh, of, of DevOps, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so I think we'll, we'll see both of those only reinforce each other. Uh, yep. it's, it's early, but that, that, I think that's a cycle that, you know, if, if we nail that, you know, I, I think there's a potential runaway effect there. Yep, and, and w- one thing I would add is um, the way decentralized networks work, uh, the first 100,000 users on Facebook basically didn't see any financial upside of the success of Facebook. That is not the case with uh, decentralized networks where everyone who is kind of like becoming a part of uh, the network, they own the underlying asset. If the ecosystem grows, they have potential financial upside. And I think those incentives can also drive uh, a lot of interest to these decentralized applications. And and to your point of like, they are less middlemen, uh, that translates into things like let's say um, someone want to show me ads Mm -hmm. on a decentralized application, they can just simply pay me. There are less middlemen there. And I I might be, you know, uh, it's it's like you're now monetizing your attention directly because you are in control of of your own information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. these are great. So I have a few more questions. Uh, Maybe this is changing uh, topic a little bit, but it's about the governance structure of Blockstack PDC and plans for decentralization moving forward. Yes. So we had a post about this, uh, I believe, Q4 uh, of last year, where we announced our general kind of like broader approach to path to decentralization. And the idea is, for for people who are not familiar with this, uh, Blockstack PBC, PBC stands for Public Benefit Corp, is uh, a US entity. That's the company that you know the equity investors invested in to support the project in the early days, and it's responsible for building the core protocols, the developer tools. And over time, we want to have multiple independent entities in the ecosystem, and we are trying to help that. Uh, one concrete thing I can point to is the investment we made in an independent entity in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. New Internet Labs. So Larry, he's an early engineer, lives in Hong Kong, and we structured the deal in a way where uh, we don't have a lot of control of the entity. There are no overlapping directors or officers. It's a truly independent entity. Yelly can, or Larry can say whatever he wants, and, and <laughs> no one, no one gets talking, right? <laughs> which is which is good for the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, uh, similarly, I think we are partnering with certain funds, like the announcement yeah. I mentioned, which will come out tomorrow. Uh, but we have already announced our partnership with Spartan in uh, Singapore. Yep. And again, it's an independent entity. They, they work with us, but they're trying to help the ecosystem. Uh, I think you can expect some more of, um, of uh, kind of like steps from our side. 
uh, we have disclosed potential plans for a block stack foundation. And again, mm -hmm. I can't get into too much details on um, what we're thinking there, but at, when they're concrete enough, we will obviously disclose it and, and tell people about it. The general trend is that we think of decentralization not as a switch that you can just turn it on or off, but it's more like a path. Mm -hmm. And you need to be very thoughtful about the steps you're taking and how you are walking down, down the path. And which is something which is a bit different from other projects, which might jump into decentralization too early and don't fully realize that there might be many, many negative impacts of like not having clear leadership, not having a well executing machine, right? Like that is able to actually deliver results. Yep. Yeah. So um, this one is uh, a question about um, valuing tokens. So can you touch on how you come to value tokens? Um, they've read the SEC site. SEC filing, uh, but they feel like there are many pieces influencing valuation. Um, so, you know, how should they think about them? Um, I know that, you know, this is a, it's uh, speculative and. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me see that. I have to word it very carefully, right? Um, I think the, if you look at the SEC circular, what it says is that the round that Lux Capital invested in, uh, the 12 cents price, Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty much like private conversations with sophisticated investors. And we looked at what the demand looks like and what would be the market clearing price, right? And, and we were kind of right. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to uh, raise close to $50 million uh, and we raised $47.5 million. We actually stopped. It's not that there wasn't demand but we thought that we should use some of these for incentives for new employees, right? So, mm -hmm. so the, the market clearing price was right. You also I, capped the amount any investor could put in. We also in, capped, so, yeah. like yeah. at three million. And, yeah. and uh, so, so that was 2017. And one way when we were initially thinking of like at what price should we float this in the public offering, one model is uh, just look at traditional venture capital that if that was kind of like your series A, uh, this is exactly, I think, a 2.5x multiple on the price, which you would know this better than anyone else for, for, for a, a successful startup that has de-risked the technology, that has grown the team, that has ac actually executed, that's a reasonable multiple yep. from a series A to a series B price, right? So that, that was what was in my mind. But uh, again, like I think, eventually it's, it's markets decide, right? Like if the market is willing to bear a price, the market would bear it. If the market is not, uh, it will not bear it, right? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. that's, that's how it's, uh, it's going to work. But I, I think I, I want to lay out some facts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the total number of tokens that would exist by year 2050, it's going to be roughly 2 billion. And more precisely, I think it's 2048 million. Mm -hmm. And at the 30 cents price, that values the network in year 2050 at 600 million. Right? And people can go and look at coin market cap and they would see, you know, there are projects that are in, you know, several billion dollar valuations with circulating supply. Mm -hmm. If you look at circulating supply, uh, that's not the year 2050, the 2 billion. If you look at circulating supply, I think the exact number is disclosed on our FAQs. FAQs yeah. <laughs> but if you just pick the total number of tokens that are liquid uh, today and multiply that by 30 cents, the, the number is, I think, 67 million. So, this, so the circulating supply of uh, our tokens is valued at the market cap is 67 million. And it will slowly increase because more tokens are unlocking every month. Uh, and then obviously the public offering will also result in tokens entering the market as well, right? And at, at, at anything below like 100 million, you are not like top 50 on coin market cap, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel very confident to say that with the amount of work that we have done and our developer community is one of the fastest growing developer communities uh, in crypto. Uh, like these are just kind of like the, the facts and people can, can go and uh, take a look at them. Uh, and to decide how the token is valued or if it's, if it's overvalued or if it's undervalued. So from a venture perspective, we seem appropriately valued from a relative crypto 
perspective, I, I would argue we are wildly undervalued. I, I cannot I'm allowed say that. to say no, that. I'm no, I, 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 I <laughs> never going to be allowed to do this again, but I'll just <laughs> say it while I can. And... Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, we're, we're getting towards the end of time here. Um, someone asked, uh, what are some long-term use cases of Blockstack and what are you most excited for? So maybe you have some answers, maybe you have some answers. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, when I dream about this or what, when I think about like what's the end goal, right? Uh, what we're doing in a way reminds me of Linux. Like I was one of those kids. So going back to Rawalpindi, I, I grew up in <laughs> Rawalpindi. It's a small army city next to Islamabad, which is like the capital and all the rich people live there. Uh, and that's where uh, Zavin was born as well. And growing up there, when I got my hands on the first computer, Windows required a license, and um, I just went for Linux because it was open, yeah. and you could uh, also uh, more than more than a license, you could get a pirated version as well. But uh, you could actually fiddle with it. You could change the source code, and you can you can make the computer do what you want it to do. And the initial applications were clunky. Like imagine the word on Linux in '99. Yeah. Compare that to Graphite and, and Google Docs. Right? But that version was free and open, and I could tweak it versus Microsoft Word. And slowly, like, the, the Linux market started maturing. Like, especially on the server side, it completely took over. Like, all the data centers now use Linux. And even, even on the desktop side, I think there is a healthy community around applications. So for me, the end goal really is that on a daily basis, all the applications I use, like messaging or mail, there's Dmail that's an app built on a block stack or Google Docs, I would like to use an app on Blockstack that is actually better, more secure, and private, and I'm not reliant on any single company. Yep. Right? So that's the end game where you're no longer uh, using a centralized service, period, and you're done. Right? So, so the desktop is completely, or the mobile device is completely taken over, yep. uh, and that, that's, that's the end game in, in my mind. I, uh, I think philosophically, I'm 100% in agreement with you. The, the two extras, maybe two shades of color, just for me personally, is my family grew up in Rawalpindi or was born in Rawalpindi. Uh, my family is ethnically Kashmiri, which, you know, if you go to at least uh, Indian Pakistan governed Kashmir today, uh, still massive internet shutdown, still kind of uh, curfews post sunset uh, a lot of the time, military checkpoints every few blocks. Um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, what should be a democratic state, at least on the Indian side, feels like an authoritarian state uh, there. And so thinking about the ways that uh, we can and we should use technology to, fight, I think, fight for justice. I think one of the beautiful things that Blockstack is building is it's building, you know, a potential fabric for censorship-free uh, applications. Uh, and in those applications, I think, Eric, are going to give all sorts of people around the globe voices. Uh, it's one of the beautiful things I think Justin at Graphite is building. And I think that's why one of the reasons why the community has really kind of circled around him. Uh, but I, I think that's really exciting. And one of the big kind of worries about technology today that I have, and I think we're seeing it with Google, uh, certainly with Facebook, uh, is just, you know, even with Amazon and Uber, uh, I think you start to see kind of these monopolies emerge and they're really sticky and they're really hard to disintermediate. So if, if we are successful, I think we, we see a world where uh, the, you know, the, the most popular applications aren't dominated by any single parties. Uh, they're more nimble. Uh, and I think it's net a huge benefit for society and for all of us as users, I think we're in a much better, safer, and happier spot. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Well, that kind of fits really well with it. We have um, new stickers and a few billboards that say, you know, instead of Google's old, like, don't be evil. Yeah. It's now yeah. can't be evil. It's like yeah. basically building in, you know, that security and safety for your end users. So they don't even have to think about being locked in. Um, they can think about, you know, owning their own data and having that portability as well. I love that. Yeah. 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 Well, we're just about time here. So um, maybe I'll just wrap up with like more information that people can follow up. Um, yes. We can also answer um, any other questions in Telegram. So I know the team is in there and we will take care of those as well. Uh, but just, you know, where, where people should head yes. now. Yes, <laughs> I think uh, most of the information for the project is at blockstack.org. And most of the information for the uh, offering is on stackstoken.com. Um, our offering is open. And the, the reason 
and that we went through all the kind of like effort to get through the SEC approvals was to open this up to the US market, was to open it up to normal users, like normal retail investors. We want them to be a part of our network. Uh, we want to grow our user base. We want to give them a, a potential financial upside. If there is one, you should read all the <laughs> risk factors. <laughs> uh, but it, it's really like we want them to not limit it, this uh, participation in our network to as much as we like Zavin mm -hmm. and Lux Capital to people like Lux uh, and, and, and Zavin. That's great. And where can people learn more about Lux Capital if they have those next, you know? Uh, Lux.vc. It's a pretty simple URL. You can follow me at Zavindar. Um, we're searchable online, but really, I think today is all about you guys. So <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Well, maybe they can ping you with some questions too. Yeah, yeah. feel free to Twitter, <laughs> Twitter me if you have any questions. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us um, online and uh, thanks for watching this video. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys.